on your feet, we're going to the Word of God. I've been teaching a series called The Pacemaker. And I'm excited to get back into it and share some more today. We're on our way into David's tabernacle and we're starting to understand who David is and what he does and the unique role that he plays. Uh, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 through 12. But I want to show you something right quick. Uh, kind of give you a clue. There was a movie came out some time ago, uh, and I like the title of it because it represents where we're going today. And I want Jamel to put it on the screen so you can see where we're going. So, so when you when you leave church today, you tell them that I preach the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know that's that's me up there. Well, some of it's me anyway. <laughs> We're, our subject this morning is Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're going to be in Second Samuel chapter six, verse one through twelve. When you have it, say Amen. Put my scripture up. I know I'm pretty, but take me down. <laughs> David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baalah in the Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubims on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, and sistrums and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the ox stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. For three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire house. Good God of mercy. Now King, David, now King David was told the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to, the, to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. They brought, this is the 17th verse, they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent hmm, that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Today we're talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark. Let's pray while we're standing. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. Let a special anointing saturate us as we go into the Word of God. Use these lips of clay that they might be endowed in such a way that I might be a blessing to your people, that I might inform them, that I might inspire them, that I might impart unto them the very essence of God. I believe you for great things today. Have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. 
If David had a brand, his brand would be presence. He was a unique kind of guy. He was called of God because his, his priority was the presence of God. You will remember, and it's important that you remember throughout this discussion that we're going to have today, that God chose him because he was after his heart. Why did God choose you? You have been uniquely placed in position for such a time as this. Why did God choose you? Do you really think it's because you're the most talented? Do you really think it's because you're the most gifted? Do you really think it's because you're so essential and that nobody out of 8 billion people on the planet could do what you do like you do? So if it's not for performance, what is it about you that God has selected you that you would be so highly favored? Maybe you don't realize how highly favored you are, but you are highly favored. Highly favored people say something to me. David's priority was the presence of God. Saul's priority was the position of God. Saul wanted the position, but he didn't want the presence. I'm amazed at the people who want positions. They want titles that they won't fulfill. They want positions that they won't function in. All Saul wanted was the position and the opportunity to say he was king. David never cared about positions. He cared about the presence of God. Somebody say, Lord, give me your presence. And he was willing to move everything out of the way so that the presence of God could operate fully in his life. And that's why God promoted him. Presence leads to promotion. For promotion cometh not from the east or the west, but from the Lord. So if promotion comes from God, if I get in God's presence, I can be promoted. If you really believe that, every chance you got an opportunity, you would be all up in God's face. But because in spite of the fact that we say, man, we really don't believe God for promotion, we then sit through the praise service nonchalant, indifferent about really worshiping God because we have not associated presence with promotion. If we really thought about presence and promotion being integrated instead of spending all of our time begging God for the next promotion, we would enter into this gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name. And we would move everything out of the way that hinders us, whether it's distractions, worry, pride, envy, strife, flesh, lust, sin. I don't care what it is, we would move it out of the way so that we would have free access to bring the presence of God in. David was not without obstacles. He had obstacles that he had to overtake. There were a group of people called the Jebusites that were tied up in what they called the stronghold of Zion. And he had to overcome the Jebusites and drive them out of the stronghold. I want you to understand what a stronghold is. A stronghold was a geographical position that if a people got in the stronghold, they would have the advantage and once they had a strong hold, they would have a strong hold against attacks from any outsiders and they were hard to overthrow. There are some things that can get in your life and they take a strong hold in your life. Some things you can shake off easily, but other things it takes a while to really get the release from because it's got a strong hold in your life. But you got to clear out the stronghold and drive out the Jebusites so that the glory of the Lord can come through. Some of you don't sense the glory of the Lord like the person sitting next to you because the Jebusites still have a stronghold. So you can't trust your senses to even know what a good service is because a good service is passing you by because you still got territories that's still up under control of the enemy and you're not willing to drive out the Jebusites so that you can experience the power of God. Somebody shout, I want the glory. 
I want the glory of God in my life. I want the ark back. I want to find that thing that's missing in my life. I want to walk in the glory of the Lord. I want to walk in the glory of the Lord because the Bible said, in thy presence there is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. If I get in his presence, I don't have to struggle to be happy. I'll have pleasures forevermore. If I get in his presence, I'll have peace complete. If I get in his presence, you won't bother me like you bother me right now if I can just get in the presence of God. We need the presence of God. And I want to take you back and I want you to understand that Israel had lost the presence of God. Israel in the Old Testament represented the people of God. The people of God had lost the presence of God. Now you know the sinners didn't have the presence because that it, by definition uh, it, it is, is a sinner. The absence of separation from God. It is not only the deeds that you do the sinful acts that you do, but it is your unbelief that has built a wall between you and God. Unbelief is at the root of all sin. Unbelief is at the root of all sin. Unbelief. Is, God, has, God is upset because we have not believed in his only begotten son. Unbelief is at the root of all sin. And those things separate us from God. As it was, as it is now, it was then, the children of Israel had become separated from God. You will remember some time ago, I have taught on it before, how the Philistines came in and began to fight with the children of Israel. And the children of Israel got the Ark of the Covenant and they thought that they could come down with the Ark of the Covenant and get the victory just by the symbol of God, but they didn't have relationship with God. And they shouted unto God, you will remember, and they got defeated. They got their pants beat off of them. 30,000 people died. 30,000. Imagine 30,000 people died. That's this whole room filled with people three times. That's how many bodies were dead. Because they took God for granted. Because they were playing church. Because they wouldn't get serious. There were casualties to their cool attitude toward God. I'm wondering how many things are dying in your life because of the cool attitude that you have toward God. Now, all of a sudden, they thought, sure, they get the victory. They did not get the victory. In fact, they got defeated. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were killed. When Eli heard about it, he fell off his throne and broke his neck. When he broke his neck, his daughter-in-law went into labor and had a child, and they named him Ichabod, and Ichabod means the glory of the Lord is departed. This is a bad day. The glory of the Lord has departed from the people of the Lord. To lose the glory of the Lord is to lose your advantage, your strength, your weapon. Everything you need to get ahead is in the presence of the Lord. You can lose the presence of the Lord and not even realize it. The Bible says of Samson that he got up and shook himself and he wished not that the glory of the Lord had departed from him. He didn't even know that the glory of the Lord had departed from him. He just thought, I'll go into my routine and I'll be as effective as I was. But if the glory of the Lord is not on you, what you might have the talent, but the talent won't have the impact. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You might have the talent, but you will not have the impact. You need the glory of the Lord. You need the glory of the Lord. You need the glory of the Lord. It's not enough for you to throw your rock, David. The rock without the glory would knock down a dog. But if the glory of the Lord gets behind it, it'll bring down a giant. I sense there's some people in this room that's got some giants you need to bring down. Tell your neighbor, I need the presence of the Lord. That means you can sit there with your legs crossed, be cool, lay back and watch everybody else. I can't do that because I need the presence of the Lord. 
You can stay home with your pajamas on and watch CNN. I can't do that. I need the presence of the Lord. I didn't just come because I want to be seen. I came because I have a need in my life. I need the presence of the Lord. It was a sad day. The girl goes into labor and births a child called Ichabod and says, the glory of the Lord has departed. And it was really, really sad. Eli falls off the throne and loses and, and breaks his neck, symbolizing that when the glory of the Lord departs, you lose headship. Your neck breaks. Your head falls off. Your plans fall off. Your thoughts fall off. Your peace falls off. Everything that your mind would normally conceive falls off because the glory of the Lord has departed. We have a succession of judges that come into lead leadership, but none of them bring back the glory. Now, what I want you to understand, the worship didn't stop. I'm going to say that again. The glory of the Lord has gone into the hands of the Philistines. The Philistines have taken the Ark of the Covenant. Eli the priest is so shocked he broke his neck. But there was service next Saturday. They continued to offer up sacrifice just like they did before. They offered up sacrifice before, uh, before the veil to the holies of holies. There was nothing behind it. You'd be surprised at the people who make noise and there's nothing behind it. You can go through your form and fashion, but it doesn't mean that the glory is there. You can still make noise and still offer sacrifice and go into your routine, but the glory of the Lord had departed. So shocking it was that Eli breaks his neck, his daughter goes into labor and births a baby and calls Ichabod, and nobody goes to get it back. It seems easier for them to worship in front of an empty veil than it is to fix what's broken and bring back the glory. Now the glory of the Lord has fallen into the hands of the Philistines and God gets upset because they have put him in the temple with Dagon, an idol God. And in the morning, Dagon had been knocked over. So they stood their God back up. You know, I don't want a God that I have to stand up. I want a God that can stand me up. I don't want a God I have to carry. I want a God that can carry me. They stood him back up, honey, and the next morning they woke up, all of his parts were falling off. God, God had already said, I will have no other God before me. Everything that you stand up in the face of God, God said, I will knock it down. I will have no other God before me. And so it's kind of funny. The Lord got mad at him and struck him with emeralds. You don't know what emeralds are. Emeralds is an Old Testament name for hemorrhoids. He gave them a pain in the you-know-what. And he attacked them with hemorrhoids severely till the pain got so bad, they said, we're going to give your God back. We're going to give him away. We don't want God here. God has a strange way of fighting, don't he? When God says, turn me loose, he means turn me loose. I will attack you in secret places. Oh, y'all aren't hearing me today. I will attack you in secret places until you do what I want done. I am God, and besides me, there is no other. And you'll be smiling at everybody, but in your secret life, you'll be up under attack because I know where to hit you where it hurts. 
And the reason I thought it was important to bring it up because you might be sitting up here listening at me right now and being attacked in secret places. You look good and you smell good. You got your hair done, got your nails done. You got on nice clothes red on the bottom of your shoes, but it doesn't mean that you're not being attacked in secret places. God said, I'm going to continue to attack you in secret places until you turn me loose. That's why I don't have to worry about my enemies, because God will attack my enemies in secret places. Yeah, you jump on me, he's going to hit you in places that I never even thought about hitting you. I wish I had a witness in here. Finally, the Ark of the Covenant comes to rest amongst the men of Kerjarth Jerem. And for 20 years or more, the Ark of the Covenant is resting with the men of Kerjarth Jerem. That does not mean that Moses' tabernacle is not still going on. Lambs still being slain. Sacrifices still being offered up. They're just being offered up before an empty veil. Religion. R religion. Religion without relationship. That's what this is. That's what this whole period represents. Religion without relationship. It's a women's day, everybody wear white. It's a missionary's day, everybody put on doilies on their head. It's a chicken cutting committee's meeting after church. We got this coming at five o'clock, religion without relation. This is the Eastern Jurisdictional Council of the Religion without, don't sit there and ask the seats of reserve for so religion. Religion without relationship. People who get caught up in religion may not even notice that they haven't seen any glory in their church for years. They start bragging about how quiet it is and how peaceful it is and how quick they get out of church and how predictable it is and you know exactly what's going to happen. Everybody stands at the same time, sits at the same time, kneels at the same time. They start bragging about the fact that there has not been a disruption in their service for 20 years. When the glory of the Lord comes into a house, he will disrupt the house. <clears throat> I'm going to tell y'all, maybe you can handle it. When the glory of the Lord comes in the house, he will disrupt the house. You may not have no seats. You may end up laying on your face before God. When the glory of the Lord comes in, he will disrupt the house. When the glory of the Lord comes in, they will tear the roof off the house to lower down somebody in the presence of the Lord. When the glory of the Lord comes in, dry bones will come together, bone to his bone. When the glory of the Lord comes in, cancer will have to get up and walk out of here. When the glory of the Lord comes in, he will cause a disruption. Somebody make a disruptive noise in this room. Yes, yes, yes. Did you see what I just did? I had to make a noise because noise disrupts silence. And I told you there's something between making a noise and the move of the Holy Spirit. Because God says, if you use what you got to disrupt noise, I will use what I've got to disrupt everything in your life. Touch your neighbor on the left and the right and say there's about to be a disruption. There's about to be a disruption. <clears throat> oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. 
Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. You may be seated, I'm going deeper. You see, silence is like darkness. It is not a thing. It is not a thing, so it can't be quantified. It can't be measured. It, you cannot measure silence. How silent was it? You can't measure. How dark was it? See, see, silence, darkness is the absence of light. Silence is the absence of sound. You got it. You got it. You got it. That's why the first thing the enemy wants to do whenever he attacks you is shut your mouth. See, <laughs> y'all are pushing me. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to say this little part. See, it's nice to say thank you, Jesus. It's nice to say glory to God. It's nice to say hallelujah. But if you don't do anything but make a joyful a noise disrupts the silence. There's been silence over your house. There's been darkness over your house. But if you open your mouth, you can disrupt. Well, if, if, if all of that is so easily done, none of the judges went after the glory. They sat on their positions. They made their rulings. They subdued their territories. They claimed their positions. They fought the Philistines. They didn't get back the glory. Saul became king, was anointed, anointed with oil to be king, became the king of Israel, and never sought the glory. You're going to be president without glory? You going on that new job without glory? You're entering into this new season in your life without glory. You're collecting all the accolades and commendations of men of what men say about you, and you haven't asked God what does he say about you? Saul never went after the glory because he wanted, he wanted the position, but not the presence. God got sick of him. Eventually, God will get sick of you. <clears throat> Just because judgment is not executed speedily doesn't mean it won't happen. God got sick of him, said, all right, I have found me a man who is after my heart. Samuel, you remember I was teaching you? Samuel, stop crying. Stop crying over what I have rejected. I have found me a man who is after my heart. Tell somebody, say, David is the man. David. Who is after God's heart. Now, when I was teaching on Moses' tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, the holies of holies, I showed you that the Ark of the Covenant was in the holies of holies. 
It was the heart of Moses' tabernacle. It was what all the lambs were about. It was what all the smoke was about. It was what the table of shoe bread was about. It was what the veil being ripped was all about, was to get to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the heart, the central, the apex of worship. That was the place on the Day of Atonement where the children of Israel were covered for an entire year. The Ark of the Covenant was the heart of Moses' tabernacle. It was the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God. It was the Ark of the Covenant that Shekinah glory rested upon. It was the Ark of the Covenant where the angels stared one at the other one. It was the Ark of the Covenant that held the mercy seat. It was the Ark of the Covenant that held the Ten Commandments. It was the Ark of the Covenant that held Aaron's rod that budded. It was the Ark of the Covenant that handled the pot of manna. The Ark of the Covenant represented the heart of God. So wherever they carried it, they brought the heart of God into the battle with them. They got the victory. God said, I have found me a man. You just got it. You just got it. God said, I have found me a man who is after my Oh, my. Oh, my. Can God count on you to be after his heart? Or are you just after his promises? Are you just after his promises? After his possessions? See, you're not after God's heart, you're after God's hand. God said, I found me a man who is after my heart, not just serving me for what's in my heart. Oh, it got quiet. I must have hit somebody real bad in here. The reason that you only get aggressive when you're in trouble is that when you're in trouble, you need God's hand. So for a few weeks, you come to church and get real serious about God because you're after God's hand. But you never build a relationship with him because you never were after his hand. So when the Spirit of the Lord gets high in the service, you feel uncomfortable because, because God is bringing his heart to the conversation and you're not bringing yours. And there's nothing as uncomfortable as being in a room with somebody that loves you and you don't love Because their love brings conviction on you. It makes you uncomfortable because you know you're supposed to reciprocate, but you're not feeling them like they're feeling you, and you don't know what to say. That's why you don't like the worship part of the service. Because the worship part of the service demands that you bring your heart before God and be in the presence of God so that you can love him back like he loves you. Now, I'm going to say some things. <clears throat> Might make you uncomfortable. But I'm a raider of the lost art. And the raider of the lost art is supposed to make you uncomfortable. I texted my brother yesterday two or three times during the day. My sister and I, my sister, my brother and I, have a chat line we're on, I call it a chat line, but it's text line, group text line, and we can just talk about anything and everything all the time, every day. Every day, it's gonna beep every day. My kids, my wife and I are on another one, and we talk every day about something, something silly. It's not always something spiritual. Sometimes it's something goofy. Sometimes it's something funny. Sometimes it's something to make somebody laugh, but we communicate every day. I can't imagine having family. And you don't communicate. I know that's a reality for some people. I'm not criticizing you. I can't imagine not communicating to something I'm related to. 
I'm going to say something to you. A smiley face, a thumbs up, a yo, what's up? How you doing? What's going on with you? You crazy, you're ignorant, you fool. I'm going to say something. If I don't talk to my brother or sister, or my kids don't hear from me for several days, they're going to be concerned. How in the world did the children of God be silent from God for 20 years and nobody go looking for him? If you don't hear from your daughter, you ought to call the missing persons. How could God be gone for 20 years and nobody go looking for him? How could God be gone from your life? And you all up in people's face. All up in people's face. Trying to be with the big shots and the haves and the have-nots. And you're always someplace you can't even afford to be. Trying to do something you're not skilled to do. And you miss the people, but you never miss God. I tell the people that work with me, you have to communicate with me. If you don't communicate with me, it irritates me. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's going on. I want to hear about everything. I want to hear from you even if, you, even if hearing from you is disruptive. Even if you call at the wrong time. Even if I don't get back to you on the text for three days, I still want to hear from you. I want to know what's going on. I worry when I don't hear from you. If I ask you to do something and I don't hear back from you, I don't know it's done. Say something back. I did it. It worked. It didn't work. It almost worked. The cat died. The chicken got the measles. I got the mumps. I fell off the wagon. My leg is broke. Tell me something! <laughs> 20 years. They have not heard from God. 20 years, they have gone through routines without hearing from God. 20 years, preacher, you've been preaching without your anointing. You wonder why you're not seeing signs and wonders. You're not talking to God. You, you are serving leftover T.D. Jake sermons. Something you scrub off on Saturday night or whenever you have to speak. How could Saul be anointed by God and then not seek the heart of God? But he did. And God said, I've rejected him. I found a man. I found a guy that prioritizes me. That's what it's about. It's about priority. I found a guy that values me. I found a guy who will put me first. I found a guy that won't be satisfied to have position without presence. I have found a guy who is after my heart. I have found a guy who writes poetry to me, who sings songs on the mountaintops to me, who dances around when nobody's looking in my presence. I have found a guy who will date me, he flirts with me, he blows me kisses. I'm going to make him king because he is after my heart. In my text today, <laughs> we are watching David go after God's heart. He has been king of Judah and now Israel. He has been anointed three times. He has been anointed by Samuel and told he was going to be king. He's been anointed by Judah because Judah and Israel have now split. They have separated one from another. The people of God have fallen out. Without God to hold them together, they fell apart. Without God to hold the family together, it falls apart. Without God to hold the church together, it falls apart. Without God to hold the marriage together, it falls apart. 
children of Israel have fallen apart from Judah. They've all gone in their own way. Now David has been anointed king over Judah. Six years later, he's anointed king over Israel. This is a part of his first act of leadership as king of Israel. With 30,000 people behind him, he now says, I'm going down there to get the glory. I'm going after God's heart. I'm going to chase it down. I'm going to get it. I'm going to, I'm going to move every stronghold. I'm going to tear down every idol. I'm going to get rid of the Jebusites. I'm going to bring back the glory of the Lord. And when he got the Ark of the Covenant, they brought it to him on a new cart. And he said, good, okay, we're going to ride it in. Now, you got to understand, you can go about the right thing the wrong way. You would think that if you do the right thing, you wouldn't have any hiccups. I'm going to help somebody today. You would think that if you were, your heart was in the right place, you wouldn't have any problems. You would think that if you meant well, everything would go right. That's what's wrong with your marriage. You thought if you meant well, everything would go right. You're still going to have problems. You thought if he was in love, he wouldn't have any problems. You're still going to have problems. You thought if you had a degree, you could get on the job, everything would go good. You're still going to have problems. Problems strengthen you. Problems perfect you. Problems empower you. Problems build up a relationship. My wife and I are not stronger today because everything went right for 35 years. We're stronger today because of the things that went wrong, and we chose to ride over top of them and hold it together anyway. Somebody ought to shout in this place right now. We're together because she got used to living with this crazy guy up here. She figured out a way to live with this crazy guy. I figured out a way to live with her. I know she's making faces behind my back. I know it. I know her. I know it. I know it right now. I'm going to say she took the whole show with her face and all of y'all looking at her. Nobody looking at me. The blood of Jesus. Relationships have dysfunctions. They have problems. They go through tight places. Ministries go through tight places. Businesses go through tight places. You're not going to build a business and not have a problem. You're going to have a problem. David is trying to bring back the ark, but he don't know how to bring it back. It's been gone for so long, he hasn't even experienced the heart of God. In his life. God has been gone since he was a baby. He doesn't know all the protocol and the routine, so he saw them bringing them on a cart. He said, good, let's get a cart. He hired a couple of them to drive the cart. They drive the cart. Ohio gets behind it. He starts cracking the whip. The oxen start going forward. The cart starts moving. It does real good. It's working real good. It's secular, but it's working real good. It's secular, but it's working. Y'all didn't hear that. It's secular, but it's working real good. You can go so far in your own way, and it'll work real good for a while, but sooner or later, the ox is going to trip. They got to the threshing floor of Ornan, and the ox tripped. Somebody in this room is in the tripping place. Yeah, your life is tripping right now. It was good a minute ago, but the ox tripped, and now everything's going crazy, and all of a sudden there's disruption. David is trying to reconcile Judah to Israel. He's trying to reconcile God to his people. He's trying to reconcile the Ark of the Covenant back to Zion. He's trying to reconcile all of this stuff. Do you really think the devil is going to let you reconcile without fighting you somewhere in your life? Slap your neighbor and say, this is a fight. 
This is a fight. Tell your neighbor, this is a fight. Now, a fight will show what you're made of. A, sh a fight will show how bad you want it. If you get discouraged and walk away and say, I can't do it, you were not the man I thought you were. A fight will really prove to the enemy, come hell or high water, I want this back. Somebody say, I want it back. Oh my God, I feel something about to break loose. The devil got nervous when you said, I want it back. Hell got upset when you said, I want it back. Witches start pacing the floor when I said, I want it back. Sickness started shaking when you said, I want it back. Say it again, I want it back. See, some folks are afraid to want. Let me come down here. Some people are afraid to want because wanting hurts. Wanting hurts. Wanting is uncomfortable. Wanting is disruptive. So they anesthetize the pain of wanting with apathy. I don't care. I don't need you anyway. It don't matter to me. I was raised by myself. I'm used to being by myself. My siblings didn't like me. I don't need you to, I don't care. You gotta put the neck in it. It ain't good till you put the neck in it. You gotta throw that neck in there for emphasis. I don't care. Trouble comes to prove do you care? The ox trips to prove, do you care? The ox trips, you know. The ark of the covenant starts sliding off the cart. Uzzah reached out to, 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 to touch the heart of God. He reached out to save what came to save him. And God got mad. He said, I don't need you to save me. You need me to save you. And the Lord killed him right on the spot. The Lord killed Uzzah for a time to save him. Because Uzzah trying to save God broke the order. God said, I don't need your hand to save me. You need my hand. And David threw his hands up. Other put his hands on. God killed him for trying to save him. David threw his hands up and said, this is too hard, I quit. Take the Ark of the Covenant which incidentally I was called to bring back. And let me reassign my responsibility to obed Edom. There are some responsibilities you cannot reassign. You, Hashanda Mokai, you have the anointing to do this. You cannot reassign this to somebody else. God called you to do this. You have the power to do this. You can't let nobody hurt your feelings so bad that you give up your place. You can't let nobody say anything that makes you give up your place. You can't let nobody around you make you deny what's in you. I'm going to tell this, you can't let nobody around you make you deny what's in you. Throw your hands and say, I want it back. I don't care if it stumbles. I don't care if it stops. I don't care if I have a setback. I want it back. 
So David gave up on his assignment. Now remember, this is the David that God chose him and made him king. Not because he was kingly. He chose him because he was after his heart. What we are looking at is the loss of purpose. If you lose your purpose, you have lost everything. If you keep your title, but you lost your purpose, you have lost everything. I don't care if they still call you Reverend Doc, Doc, Reverend, Reverend Evangelist, CEO, COO, ABO, CLDO, IBCBY. I don't care what they call you. It is not your title that gives you power. It's your purpose. When a man has purpose, oh my God, I feel the glory of the Lord. When a woman has purpose, I want every woman a purpose to make some noise in this house. Every man that's got purpose makes some noise. You cannot reassign purpose there are certain I can teach I can train I can talk I can help accentuate what God gave you I cannot give you what God gave me I remember a guy told me he said I made you who you were if you had to preach for me you wouldn't have been nobody. Wow. I made Jake's who he is. Now he won't even come preach for me. I made him who he is. So they come back and told me what he said. And I said, good. If you made one, make another. If I can make one cake, I can make another one. If I can make one house, I can make another. If you made me and now I'm acting up, make another me. The truth of the matter is except the Lord build a house. They that labor, labor, but in vain. Did nobody make you but the Lord? Somebody give him a praise right now. Touch three people and say, I got something, I got something. You can imitate it, but you can't duplicate it. I got something. I am uniquely made. I am wondrously made. I am fearfully made. I am in a category all by myself. For the next three minutes, somebody give him praise. Sit down for a minute, let me show you something. I'm almost where I want to be. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place. Shout yes! I want you to see that he who came to reconcile has now been separated. 
He who came to make the connection has now been dislodged. He has sent the Ark of the Covenant into the house of Obed-Edom. And now he is separated from his purpose. And so what the Lord did, the, the, the Bible says that the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. God said, whether you want it or not, I am who I am. I'm not going to stop being me because you stop being you. If you won't let me bless you, I'll bless him. Look at your neighbor and say, if you don't want it, I want it. For three months, God blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Hallelujah to God. Every now and then, God will give you somebody else's blessing. Let me prove it to you. He said, I'll give you houses that you didn't build. I'll give you vineyards that you didn't grow. Somebody right now is standing in somebody else's blessing. Shout yes unto God. Touch your neighbor and say, you got three months. You don't have time to be cute. You don't have time to worry about what you got on. You got three months to get this together. You got three months. Who am I talking to? At the end of three months, because see, when something is really yours, You get tired of somebody else walking around in something that was meant for you. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of not having my peace. I'm sick of not having my joy. I'm sick of not walking in my wisdom. I'm sick of not walking in my wealth. I'm sick of not walking in my peace. Enough is enough. Throw your hand up and say, I want it back. So the Bible said that David walked over to old man Edom's house and started knocking at the door. Knocking at the door is a disruption. If you want the glory back, you got to disrupt some stuff. I want to hear a disruption in this house. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, 
Somebody give him a praise. Somebody give him a praise. Yeah! Yeah! Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Go ahead. Praise him. Go ahead. Praise him. Go ahead. Praise him. Come out of your flesh. Come out of yourself. Come out, come out wherever you are.
open your mouth and give him praise. to the altar right now. Every millennial, every millennial, don't walk, don't strut. Every millennial in here, run to the altar right now. I got something to tell you. 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 Every millennial, every millennial. Come out from where you are. 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 I got something to tell you. Whatever it takes, 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 whatever it takes. When I was studying this text, the Lord told me to call you down to the altar. There's a little verse <coughs> in my text that I want to remind you of. It says, and David was 30 years old when he was anointed to be king. I don't want you to picture no gray-haired, bent-over king. God gave him the power in his youth, anointed him for headship in his youth. At 30 years old, the power of God set him in a place. That's why. When Jesus turned 30, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel. Slap your neighbor and say, it's your time. And it's your turn. It's your time. And it's your turn. It's your time. It's your turn. And it's your turn. It's your time. It's your time. Just because your ox stumbled doesn't mean your destiny is destroyed. Just because you had a setback, got in trouble, made a mistake, had a disappointment, lost somebody along the way, just because the ark slipped, just because other died, just because the ox tripped, doesn't mean it wasn't for you. If it was easy, anybody could do it. You give up too soon. When you run into hardship, you take hardship as a sign that maybe I wasn't supposed to do it. 
You got to be tougher than that. You got to be tougher than that. You got to see the hardship and understand that the devil wouldn't be fighting me if God wasn't about to bless me. Lift your hands. See, you've been too quiet. You got to disrupt some things. You've been watching everybody else praise God. But you got to disrupt some things. Open up your mouth and disrupt the atmosphere. Whatever disrupt. It takes. Disrupt. Whatever it takes. Disrupt. Whatever it takes. Disrupt the atmosphere. Whatever it takes. Disrupt the atmosphere. Whatever it takes. Disrupt it. Whatever it takes. Disrupt it. Whatever it takes. Unsettle it. Disturb it. Whatever. Mess it up. Whatever. Make some noise. Whatever it Get takes. Get out of order. Whatever it takes. Shout out the down. Whatever it takes. Shout out the down. Whatever it takes. Shout out the down. Shout out to God! Whatever it takes! Shout out to God! Whatever it takes! Shout out to God! Whatever it takes! Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it takes! Whatever it takes! Whatever it takes! Whatever it takes! Whatever! I'm trying to tell you, your time for sitting back being quiet is over. From this day forward, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you. Disrupt some things. Make some noise. Make some noise. Start something. Build something. Make something happen. The anointing of the Lord God be upon you. His anointing is on you. The anointing of the Lord on you. The anointing of the Lord God is upon you. And upon your house. And upon your generation. As I lay hands on you. The anointing of the Lord God be upon you. Lift your hands. Open your mouth, make some noise, disrupt. I want you to disrupt. I want you to break loose. I want you to break through. I want you to go forward. In the name of Jesus. I want you to come out. In the name of Jesus. I want you. In the name of Jesus. I want you. In the name of Jesus, I anoint you. I anoint you now. I anoint you right now. I anoint you right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Disrupt. Disrupt! 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 Disrupt it! Disrupt! Disrupt! Disrupt it! Disrupt it! I break the curse! I break the curse over your house! I break it over your life! Disrupt some things! Right now! Right now, in the name of Jesus, disrupt it. Oh, 
Open your mouth to God! If there's any hope for this country, it's in you. You are the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Your destiny demands that you go get 
everything they said you wouldn't get, everything they said you wouldn't be, everything they said you couldn't have. You are the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Go get that degree. Go open that business. Go start that company. Go fulfill your dream. It ain't going to be easy. Don't let the tripping of the ox make you give up on your dream. This word, Shandabekeshaya, this word is as much for you as it is for anybody in this room. David was 30 when he was anointed king of Israel. Means he was 24 when he was king of Judah. Means he was a teenager when he was anointed of Samuel. You ain't got to wait till you're all dried up. All the juice has gone out of you. He called us because we know the way. We know the way. You ain't getting rid of us. I ain't mean it like that. He called us because we know the way. He called you because you're strong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm with you. Somebody. Hey. Glory to God. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in here. Many of you have strength. Some of you, your strength has been misdirected. It's been misguided. It's been misused. It's been abused. What I want you to do is turn your strength towards something positive. You'll never be. You'll never be. Never again will you be as strong as you are today. Never again. You'll never have as much energy as you have today. Every day will take a little bit out of you. You can't afford to wait. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder. Touch them right on their shoulder. I wonder if you're touching a king. I wonder if there's a queen in that woman. God is calling you to go get what the other generations lost. Press down on that person. The hand of the Lord is on you. After all the stuff you've been through, the only reason you survived is because the hand of the Lord is on you. You are not your own. It's time for you to get yourself together. Stop sitting back watching it. Obey and eat them, be blessed. Get your stuff back. Father, I pray that the king and the queen would rise up in everyone in this house, young and old, black and white, rich and poor. I don't care what the circumstances are. I pray, God, that a hunger would get in them so strong that they become raiders of the lost ark. Whatever it takes to get it back, I want it back. I want it restored, I want it reclaimed, I want it revived, I want it renewed. I couldn't reach every one of them, God, but you can. And I pray that the anointing would fall on everyone that's being touched right now. From the front row to the back of the building, to the balcony, and in every aisle, let the Spirit of God fall 
in a supernatural way. And I declare, Lord, from this day forward, they will never be the same again. Never. Never. They will never be the same again. In the name of Jesus, lift your hands, open your mouth, and disrupt something. Sunday, next Sunday, we're going in, into the tabernacle of David. I had to get the ark in the tent. And now we're going in the tabernacle of David. The reason I want every one of you, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, right and wrong, to be in this house is because David found a key that nobody else knew, that accessed God in a way that nobody else had. He literally changed the game. He literally changed the game. He left the traditional and he did the spectacular. He literally changed the game. And the Bible said, in the last days, I will restore the tabernacle of David. That means the sign of the end times is that I will raise up a generation that changes the game. He didn't, he didn't follow none of Moses' rules, but he changed the game. You've got to be here next Sunday because this marks the beginning of a revolution in your life. This marks the beginning of a new focus. I call you out of every distraction. This is your season to focus, to use your strength to change your life so that the old person you becomes will celebrate the young person that you are because the old person you become is depending on the strength of the young person that you are to do something that will last, to do something that will matter, to do something that will change. You will have no more to consume in your old age than you killed in your youth. So it's giant killing time. Yeah, baby. It's giant killing time. It's giant killing time. I want you to bring me a giant's head. I want you to cut his head off and bring it right here in the church and show me what you cut off. Cut the giant's head off. Throw a degree down on the altar, say, here's my giant. Open up a business I just incorporated, here's my giant. Record something, here's my giant. Slap your neighbor, tell him it's giant killing time. <laughs> are you with me? I say, are you with me? Holla at your boy! Do not miss it, I've only got a few weeks left. The disruptive nature of David changed the game for the next 2,000 years. He was after the heart 
of God. He wanted this, what this symbolizes, more than he wanted stuff, more than he wanted friends and followers, more than he wanted brand name clothes and junk. He knew if he got the presence of God, he would get the promotion of God. And so when I say Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm telling you, don't settle on it being gone, being lost, being over, being too late. Go get your stuff. <laughs>